My presentation is called Extreme Orcharding um, or Growing Apples in Silly Places because obviously in Denmark it's not really the right place to grow apple trees. As a, an introduction of myself, uh, I live at a farm called Davan Duich, which means Turf Tavern. It was on the Drovers Road years ago. So it was a pub basically where people used to stop in, drop their animals off, refresh, and move on the next day. Um, it's in an area of outstanding natural beauty. We're wedged between the Horseshoe Pass on one side and the Nantagarth Pass on the other side. So it gives a bit of a hint the pass on one side and the other. We're on pretty much on the top of a mountain. The other side of the Nantagarth Pass is the Vale of Cluid, which is a lovely fertile area, which would be very, very good for apple production, but they're all too busy planting, uh, growing grass for cattle and sheep over there. I started planting apple trees here in 2006. Uh, now we've got over a thousand apple trees and I've, I've stopped now. I realized I've made a bit of a mistake. Started making cider in 2005 and went as a full-time cider maker in 2011. I'm going to the next slide. I can't tell any of you how to grow apples. Um, there's plenty of books about that, but I can tell you about some of the mistakes I've made. So if you're hoping to put an orchard in, you can avoid some of the ones I made and uh, probably do a better job of it. So the first question then, what possessed me to plant an orchard? I've got all the little answers here, but basically I wanted to make a drop of cider. Um, I had made five gallons and that rightly or wrongly got me to win the bottle cider championship, the camera bottle cider champion 2006. So I wanted to make a lot more. Um, I didn't know then that I could just pick the phone up and buy apples. There were stories in the news all the time about global warming, the war weather getting warmer. You wouldn't be able to grow apples in Kent, you'd be growing peaches there. And I thought, well, I'm not that far from the three counties and all the rest of it. Uh, mixed farms, we had cattle, sheep, pigs, hens. So we had great soil. That wasn't a problem, I didn't think. I'd strapped the farm sprayer when I was about 16, so it's organic as you can get without actually paying the soil association two grand a year and we've got crab apple trees on the farm which have survived very well they've been here a lot longer than i have so that, that gave me the uh, the incentive to go ahead and then the next decision what type of orchard to plant um, i love to see a big you know a big standard orchard uh, my favorite one is that roly orchard just off the a49 as you come as a lemster on the way home um, but we still had sheep and cattle then, so I knew it was going to point us to be putting a, a bush orchard in at the time. I wanted an orchard that would grow organically. I didn't want to be spraying. I didn't want to be messing about with chemicals. And I thought a standard orchard was a, a lot more, a magnificent thing to behold. A spectacular vision, as I put there. So I thought, right, standard orchard. But... We are at a thousand feet of sea level in one of the windiest spots in the UK. So I had a few things to think about there. And if you're going to put an orchard in, you have your own things to come up against and decisions to make. In hindsight, I should have put a, a bush orchard in a much smaller field, but we'll get on to that. So my initial steps, 2005, I ordered and planted 20 apple trees all on M25 rootstocks. Mostly maiden whips, apart from one two-year-old two uh, Tom Poth. Uh, I thought the M25s would give me a a good growing rate, and I'd get to a decent height quicker, so I'd have more, you know, things that look like trees quicker. Then I wanted two M111s in there too. Now all the books say you should plant a standard orchard at 35 foot centres, 35 feet between each tree. And I thought, well, as we're so high above sea level and we've got the wind and all the rest of it, it's not a real side wrap or growing area. I'll go for 24 and a half feet between each tree. I didn't think we'd achieve the growth, you know, and I just thought it'd be a lot, lot handier to manage. I didn't think I was going to be putting a thousand trees in either. The first few apple trees saved, so I started buying the apples from uh, Bulmer's Nursery. And... Pretty much every year I've put between one and 200 here in and I've got over a thousand trees in in four different orchards now. Go for the next slide. Uh, my initial mistakes, I think the biggest one was planting a standard orchard <laughs> anyway. 
Uh, as I was buying these trees from Bulmer's Nursery, I noticed they did sell huge, magnificent steaks, but they were £5.99. These tree steaks sold the trees up. I bought one and thought I could I could do better and cheaper. And uh, my local woodyard had packs of 97 machine machine drown posts, three to four inches diameter, eight feet long, cheap as chips. And I put them in, they were great, it was fantastic. But within a couple of years, in the winds, they'd snap like carrots. Uh, ironically, the Bulmers one snapped after five years as well. The, the, the main thing that happened after I started planting apple trees, and I was planting apple trees the first year in January in a t-shirt, laughing to myself, thinking how clever I was. Global warming had stopped. Everybody stopped talking about global warming. That was climate change. It's windier. It's snowing in August. You know, we've got sunny days in January. Everything's upside down. The wind. When I got to about 300 trees, it was quite neat. It filled one field. And I should have quit and looked after those better. But I thought, no, carry on planting. So I kept on. Um, this trying to find quality post cheaply thing, it can't be done. The ones I'm using now are UC4s, UC5s, UC6s. They've got a special preservative. They've been treated. Um, and they do last a lot longer than the machine round ones I got. Uh, but you do really have to inspect them. And what you find is if you've got a post, you know, the bottom one and a half foot of post is either the critical area is about a foot and a half either side of the ground level. If you've got a ring of knots around there, it's going to snap like a carrot. It would be best to go for um, chestnut, oak, even the plastic stakes perhaps, but they wobble around a lot when they're getting knocked in. So I'm, I'm sticking with the UC4s. Going back to the posts, my father wasn't as fit as well and well and the cattle went and I needed to control the, the grass between the trees more so we put sheep in and the sheep, they're terrible. I've got a picture I'll show you later on with the uh, sheep damage. But all, all the trees were, were guarded but it's just that some sheep can climb up, put their leg onto a post and pull uh, onto the, the branch and pull the whole thing down so the sheep went. I ended up having to get a, a small tractor and a flail mower and that worked fine for a few years. I've got a picture of that to show you later on. And since then I've gone to a big tractor and a huge mower, etc. So I've got more to tell you about that afterwards. Now the aspect of the land. You know, if you read all the books, but ultimately if you're going to put an orchard in, it's going to be on land that you own or that you're going to buy. So the considerations of that are if it's dead flat low lying, it might well flood. And apple trees don't like wet feet. Uh, apple trees will grow quite well on steep land, but if you do put trees on steep land and you think of all the future operations you're going to be doing in there, harvesting, pruning, lifting trees back up if they're blown in the wind, watering them, mowing between the trees, collecting fruit, it's a lot better if it's a little bit flatter. So I, I'd suggest, you know, a gentle slope, one or two awkward hills, you can cope with that. Next slide. That's a picture of my orchard taken I don't know, January this year, I suppose. You can see quite a few of the trees are leaning a bit. There's a there's a tie loose there, bit of a lean, bit of snow on it. You can see my tanks in the distance. That's one of the orchards. That's the second orchard that I planted that one in the winter. Right. How I plant. And then you've got a bare field and you'll you'll know where you want to put your first tree. So I mark the spot with a, with a bamboo cane and I've got this rope with knots, about six knots at 24 and a half feet in uh, intervals. And it's important that you don't have a rope that stretches. <laughs> but basically you put a loop over the bamboo, walk out and you're 24 and a half foot away, I'll stick a bamboo cane in. Another 24 and a half feet, there's a knot, I'll stick a bamboo cane in. And off you go. Now with that bamboo cane uh, and and the rope, you can also mark out your ninety degree angles. So you can you can basically build up a network of bamboo canes where your trees are going to go. And then uh, when I've when I'm ready to plant, I'll pull the bamboo cane out, put a crowbar, starts a hole in, and bash an eight inch uh, sorry an eight foot post in, so I can see just over the top of the eight foot post, and I know it's in deep enough. 
and I put that in with a Prince Charles, which if you don't know what one of those is, got one there. Let's call that because it's got big ears. There's a reason why I don't use that anymore. And then basically, you'll know how to dig holes and, and plant trees, but that's basically that. And I've got this little diagram here of a field. What's important to me in a field now, if I was going to go and plant an orchard in, in a field, is it's quite important to know where your prevailing wind direction is. And the reason for that is, you can see that I've got wind direction and an arrow. If you look around, the trees will be leaning in a certain way, blah, blah, blah. That's the way the trees are going to go over in a storm, generally. So, if the trees blow over towards that Ferrari, as you can see, it's in the middle of a row. It's okay, because you can drive through the rows still. But if it's like this lower one, it falls into the row, so you can't drive your tractor up and down. So I think... More than going with a certain hedge or anything, planting your trees in rows which are in line with the wind direction makes most sense. I was on about the uh, knotted rope to mark out the, the, the 90 degree angles and things. There's a compass there showing you what you do. You basically strike an arc with your rope and another arc with your rope, another one a bit higher, another one, then you get your 90 degrees. And so it's easy to get quite nice straight lines like that. That's supposed to be a gate at the top there. So obviously you can't put trees where there's a gate because you want your tractors and trailers to come in and out. And I, I, with planting at 24 and a half feet between each tree, I thought 12 and a half would be enough to have between a tree and a hedge. It isn't, you need a lot more. Back to, uh, back to planting. So I've got this rope with the knots in, like I said, and this is how I'm doing it now. Um, this isn't a, have I gone the right direction here? Yeah, I've gone the wrong direction. Still going the wrong direction. This is how I do it now. Sorry about that. Same rope, but I'm marking out the positions now with much, much shorter canes. And after all that knocking in the post of that Prince Charles thing, I'll just tell you about this accident I had. Can you see me forehead there? If I go like this, you can see like a, a funny line there. Well, it's about the time uh, Michael Schumacher had his uh, skiing accident. I was knocking a post in with, with one of those. And I usually give about 25 knocks and see how I'm going. See how it's gone down. Give another 25 knocks. See how it's going. It was, it was going quite well. And then the last bang I was going to give, I gave it an almighty... I walloped it down, and the trouble is, when you left it that high, your post knocker is no longer over your post. So what happened is it hit the post, and then hit me straight in the head. And I got sparked out, and it was Rosie, my little dog, who woke me up. And when I did wake up, there was blood, and I honestly thought I'd have a hole in the head. I didn't, but it was a nasty experience. So I've got a, a thing on, on the forklift truck for knocking posts in now, which I'll show you in a minute. Going back to the, the planting now, I've got a short cane in the hole and I'll put a stainless steel ring around that so I can get the, the, the cane out and then I've got a, a, a rock spike on the forklift truck which bangs in a two inch round three foot deep hole and then I lift the uh, rock spike out, put the little cane back in and reverse over the next cane and do that one and reverse over that so I can do the whole field one row like that. And then swap the rock spike for the post knocker, and I can knock in a brand new post in each in each hole, and then that's the line done. That is a very very old forklift truck. is one of my favourite tools. That that carries all my apples into the press, but also on the front there you can see the post knocker that I've got. It's a 220 kilo hammer on the on the top of there, all operated hydro hydraulically. Uh, so basically, you just put that lift that hammer up put it onto the post and whack it in. I've actually got a video of that working later on that you can see. Now here's another mistake I made. To try and get them to pollinate, because I didn't know how well it pollinates up here. You know, I read all the books and said you need your earlies this side of the wind and the mediums then and then the late ones at the end so that the wind carries it down. And I was trying to inter intermatch them all, so put one of these there and one. In the end, I did read about who, who told me just put it in the ground mate it'll get pollinated so 
rather than mixing them all up now, I do have rows of, you know, if I've got five Broxwood Fox Bob or ten Tom, I'll, I'll put them in a row so at least it's handy when I'm, when I'm harvesting. Going back to the reasons why, you know, you've got sheep's heads dropping off in late August, then your Katie's, and Porter's Perfections, I'm having to actually get them off the tree in February, so most of them laugh land in between those two extremes so there we are i've got less to walk between some of the uh the trees now when i'm when i'm collecting harvesting so to conclude with the planting i, sh I should have put a bush orchard in in a say a five acre field uh rather than the 20 acres i'm using now it'd have been a lot easier to manage a huge amount less grass to cut the shorter trees would mean to be less likely to get knocked over by the winds. I wouldn't have to buy so many new posts and perhaps easier harvesting, I don't know. At least I can get under the trees here. Looking after the trees, as the, the first line suggests, I'm not good at this. I've got all the books and I read them. I have never sprayed anything anywhere near the orchard or, or used fertilisers or anything like that. And this is another area where less trees, but more actively managed would be better. I'm time short, I'm trying to run a side of business. Uh, but one thing that I will comment on is uh, the benefits of earthworms. Here's some facts if you, if you uh, look this up. Worm castings, that's what worms do. They're five times as rich in nitrogen seven times as rich in phosphates and 11 times as rich in potash as anything else in the top six inches of soil so all these good things can be readily absorbed by the apple tree roots an earthworm creates its own weight in castings every day an acre of fertile farmland will be covered and improved by over five tons of castings over a year they carry organic material down and bring minerals back up and land drainage is improved in an area that's teeming with worms so you need to look after your orchard's worms and another thing i don't think they like is the glyphosate and all the stuff that we don't do that earthworm enemy number one the mole moles eat between half and three quarters of their own weight in worms each day they make mole hills which are awful but they mess up your mowers harvesting equipment if one stayed there hidden and got solid, it could knock you off your quad. They did try to get rid of moles in Angle C once, but they had to get them back because uh, the, the drainage suffered. So I do leave a little bit of mole activity going on. Um, they do some good things, they eat cockchafer larvae. But every February to March, I'll have a go at catching moles. So here's my pictures of traps. Oh, well, there's a mole hill exactly what I'm on about that is my mold catching kit um, basically I've got the long stainless steel rod there you can see you use that just to, to find the, the moles run and I cut a square hole in the uh, you know in the turf either with the well I usually cut it out with that and then dig it out with that and what you do you solidify both ends of the hole the run with that with the edge of the hammer so you put the end of the hammer in that way and the end of the hammer in that way so you get a good nice hard surface a nice trapping area and then you fit in one of the traps and another thing you do when you put a trap in is you mark out where you've left it because if you've got 12 traps or 20 traps you're not going to find them all unless you make leave a little mark so they're just water pipes they are cut up so you know where you've left them these are as you can see that the obvious difference between these is basically a little mole crawls under there pushes that bit up twang catches the mole but this one here hasn't got the telltale sticking up that one has so you can see if that's still set or if it's gone off some mole catches swear by these this is a double trap it's a tunnel trap it's called and basically the mole travels in through this direction knocks this and then that wire loop catches him out there and they can catch too but i've never had any luck with them uh tend to find that you, you set one side up and when you're setting this side up that one goes off and chucks soil straight into your eye so i don't like those the best if you can get hold of them 
is the one on the left hand side that's an old they don't make them like that anymore they're, they're made much cheaper but that is a, a tremendous if that one goes off it'll catch them all and that's just a picture there showing you the telltales it's the same as these here when the mole is set it's like this but if it's gone off the top of the tails will will go like that and you'll see it's caused a mole or probably missed a mole but anyway of course when you've when you've finished uh, your moling you, you chain harrow and roll there's my gang of rollers i just replace those for a better set now on to wind now so i'm always fearful of the weather forecast and um, we all get to hear you know they've started naming storms now i don't know whether we, I, I do think we get more wind now than we ever used to but you know when you when you've got storm dennis or whoever heading over and you hear all these stories excess winds at 70 to 80 miles per hour structural damage danger to life you know i'm going to be in big trouble um the general direction of these storms is usually right through our place so I'll head out and see what the status is in the orchard. In, in the orchard, if there's any broken ties, I'll try and replace those. If there's any broken posts or leaning trees, I'll try and sort those out. Make sure I've got plenty of ties and nails and posts. Sometimes I've got them, sometimes I haven't. But basically, through the storm, you just got to sit there and watch it happening because uh, it's too brutal. The, the trees really get thrashed when you get a, a nasty storm. This is one of my middle orchards. This is actually the first orchard I planted. The farm is up at the top of the hill there. Uh, you can see quite a nasty leaning tree. That's actually a Bramley, that one there. Uh, but I didn't know about pulling them back up straight when I when I first put my orchard in. Uh, so he's very easy to pick Bramley apples off, but uh, in a bit of a mess. But you can see there's a general lean. You know, we've got an assister post there. He's leaning. Overall, it's a nice, nice little patch. So when the storm's finished, and I'm actually amazed that more trees haven't come over. Um, I've got a huge pile of broken posts and broken stumps, which I haven't started uh, burning yet or using as fuel in the house. But basically, you walk around the orchard and see who's okay and who's who's gone down. Normally, the the trees that are the best performers, best growers, like Brown's apple and Perthire, I think you call them in Hereford. We call them Perthir because they're Welsh. And what's another one that likes to go over? Broxford Fox. Well, they tend to shoot up huge and tall and straight, but because they're full of leaf and full of apple, they're big targets when the wind's going. Now, a thing with a tree, when it's gone over, it can be righted up um, generally without losing much performance. Um, if it's with a good canopy it won't actually go over 90 degrees it'll go over 45 degrees so there's a good chance you you save that some of the roots will be broken it's inevitable but they will regenerate and grow again the small minor damage if the, if the, if the tie is broken and the tree starts rubbing against the guard on this side you know yeah you, you rub a bit of uh, bark but that's not a problem in the worst case scenario, you'll find that the post is still stuck to the tree and they're both flat on the ground, roots ripped apart, major fractures in the trunk. I've lost three like that for years. This picture here shows a, a tom putt. This is in the third orchard that I planted. Um, it's a, And this one is actually still over because he's such a, a solid tree um and it was so wet through the winter i just haven't had a chance to go and get him and put him right but he'll it, it, come up again so basically if the tree can be saved the first job is to check the broken you know the, the, the stump of the post that's that's gone if you're lucky it'll have snapped about that high out of the ground so you've got a purchase you can put a chain around it and lift it out but usually it's four inches below the ground so you've got to get him out without damaging the roots and I've got my own method for doing that I drill a hole in the stump and then I'll bolt in a bracket into the stump and then with a kirk bolt and then I can lift that whole thing out I've got pictures of that coming up and then you get a bigger post or solid post 
whack that one in and then lash the tree to a tractor or a forklift and pull the, the tree up. But the important thing is not to pull it, you know, you don't pull it up suddenly. Like give it, if it's probably gone over about 45 degrees, say, give it 10 degrees and go and have a cup of tea. Actually, could I have a cup of tea? <laughs> and then when you've had a cup of tea, give it another 10 degrees and then another time, and then it's back up straight. It hasn't had a massive stress. The roots have had a chance to adjust. It's worked for me. So here we've got a classic bit of storm damage here. I've, I've obviously taken the post off there, but you can see the trees leaning over. That's about 45 degrees there. And there, there's, the, there's the stump of the post sat there. And, and that's what I drill. I drill a hole in there. What's the drill drill in the hole? Now, because it's been in a storm, so the tree's been wobbling around, that, that, that post is often quite loose. So by drilling the, the hole in, bolting that bracket on, you can get it out. Steve. Times, but I will have the odd occasion when the thread just pulls straight out like it's a rotten post or, you know, there's all sorts of things. So basically you either have to dig around it to, to get it. I, I sometimes put it like a a wire noose around the post and pull it out like that or sometimes you physically just got to dig a lot a long way around it and then pull it out sideways perhaps but that's that's that steve sorry oh. to interrupt your talk hello um, what it, sorry to, it's tom here moderator Hi. we're not seeing many of the pictures for some reason at the moment i can see a slide which says corrective actions um corrective actions that's ages ago I don't know if anyone else is, is having the same problem, or maybe it's just me. I don't want to interrupt you, but um, yeah, it's. I'd, I'd love to see some of these pictures. <laughs> I, I was on corrective actions. I, I've got... Now it's on storm damage. Ah, uh, okay. Can anybody see that? Oh, no. Richard Reynolds can't see them either, and Helen Jones says she's just seeing text like me. Yeah, okay, it seems... To, I'm not quite sure why we've got this problem, but we we do seem to have it. That's annoying. Oh, that's a shame because they're, they're quite nice pictures. No, I'm I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> We're on corrective action, so you haven't got stuff. If if I, I with this shot I've got now, storm damage. You can't see anything there. No, I'm afraid not. Um. Perhaps if I go out and in again. I, that that is often a very good way of fixing the problem. Yeah. Should we try that then? I'll, I'll keep your seat warm here. All right. Okay. I'll end the show. You can't see the uh, pictures, but can't see them. Can't see the pictures. Oh, I see. So I'll just go back in. Thank you. There you go. Did you see that picture? So we're now now I can see the um, front slide, the top slide, the title slide again. Uh, extreme orcharding. And that's all you've got. That's all I can see. Well, I'm on a, a picture of an orchard in the snow here. I wonder if you're sharing the... Um, oh, it's just changed to the aspect of the land now. Right, okay. So if I swap it over now, that, that should be the orchard. I wonder if you're in presentation mode, and it's but it's not sharing the right screen or something. How infuriating. It, it is, um, oh dear, I wish I could do something more useful to help. I... Um, perhaps if I minimise it a bit, hang on, let's see if I can get into... I'll have to get out of this again. Ah, we've got a picture there, which is um, the Ferrari. Right, okay. Did you see that before? Yeah, we saw that before. You saw that before? 
but that's about the only picture I have seen before. To be to be perfectly right. fair, right? You see, didn't see the molehill. No, I sadly didn't see the molehill. <laughs> well, in that case, what I'll do, I'll shoot through this bit again because I've got the pictures of these to show you and catch up. How's that? Sounds I'll, great. I'll, I'll, I won't put it on. Uh, it was on full screen before, so I'm, I'm, this is just as if I was adjusting it. So anyway, is that okay? I can see that, yeah, I can still see the Ferrari, um, and oh yes, now I can see mole catching equipment. There we go, right. We'll go through those again then. So there's my little stainless steel rod. Use that to, to find the mole's run. So then, bloop, it goes through the mole run. So you found yeah. the run, so you can dig a square hole out. Use the, the hammer there to go either side of the, the run to make a nice sort of entrance into and out of the trap. Uh, there's the four different types of trap I've got and the little markers there. That's what we mark off the traps so that you can find it the next day or day after. So now I'll go on to manually like that. Those are average performers, those. The, the interesting that you can see that one. All right, can you? Hello. That's yeah. come up. I can see two scissor traps yeah. there and a trowel. Right. Yeah. So you've got the uh, you've got the, the telltale there that sticks out the ground, so you can see if you've caught a mole or not. And that one you have to dig down and have a look at. This is the tunnel trap, which some mole catchers absolutely swear by, but I can't stand them because I found when you're setting that side and then setting this side, this one goes off and it splashes soil into your eyes. So I, I but some say you can catch two with one go. I've never, I've never achieved that. The next picture shows a very, very old fashioned mole trap. Can you see that one? Hopefully you can see that. that if you see that in an old farm sale or anything, get that one because they're the best going. Yeah, we and, can see that now. I think there's a short delay between the picture uploading and, um, and the transition. I see. And, yeah. and, okay. and us getting to see it at this end. Yeah. Okay, right. So we're on the rollers now. See the rollers? It's not particularly important, that one. They haven't come forwards yet. No, okay, we'll, we'll skip that. We'll get on to... Um, tell me when the Tom Putts come up. That's on now here. Has he got there yet, the Tom Putt? Not for me, I'm afraid. Well, that's a, a miserable thing, isn't it? I don't know what to do, really. Well, I just think carry, carry on, Steve. Sorry, sorry to have carry, interrupted your flow there. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I've got a picture there of my tractors and everything out lifting a tree up. Which is no benefit at all to you. The biggest bane I've got is cutting grass, as you can imagine. We're on old farm pasture here, so it was grass that we wanted to to fly up and produce cattle and sheep and uh, hay and things. So it's not grass that you can buy that's specially slow at growing, which I know you, is available. Uh, for controlling the grass, sheep obviously are the best, but then you've got the problems of sheep damaging the trees. And also after the 31st of July, you don't want sheep who are anywhere near an orchard because of the E. coli 157 issues. So... We, we shut the sheep out then. And to control the grass, I started off with a one and a half metre flail behind a 27 horsepower tractor. Uh, but as the tree canopies grow, you can't get the tractor under the tree. So we're onto scythes, strimmers, all sorts of things. Uh, now I'm on a great big tractor and mower, which you probably can't see, which is <laughs> a shame. But this one that I'm showing now is. We've got that one. Yeah, can see it. 